Hello folks and welcome to the end of the summer of Sony for yours truly. It's about time quite frankly. I'm really getting tired of fixing up all these Sony tape decks and other Sony products and even though there's only been one other Sony product other than a tape deck or a cassette deck that is. Anyway, this is why I decided to save the best one for last it's because I knew I would probably be just about done with Sony as a brand for a little while after uh, servicing three straight videos in a row of the same transport. So uh, yeah, saving the best for last. We're finally getting to this and let's go. In our last video on this particular tape deck, like I said, we're bookending the season with this. We really didn't find too much wrong with it. The complaint was that it shuts down during playback, but I'm not finding that to be the case at all. Could be still there's something going on with that. Could be an extremely intermittent issue we're going to have to track down. And if that's the case, I'm glad this is my tape deck because if I had to do this for a customer's tape deck and it was sitting here trying to keep me in the dark for weeks at a time, it would really stress me out if I had to, uh, to uh, go back to a customer and say, look, I don't know what's wrong with it. I may never know what's wrong with it. What do you want to do with this thing? I don't want to have to say that to customers. That's why I'm not doing this for customers at this particular point in time. I'm giving myself two weeks to go on this one and hopefully that's enough. But uh, let's get into it now. I've got some of the parts here for this deck already and we'll talk about those real quick. Inside the box are some capacitors. These are gonna be the primary filtering caps. I only needed four of them, but I ordered a bunch of them because I want some on hand for future tape decks. These are 4700 microfarad at 35 volts. I chose 4700 so I could double the capacitance on the uh, primary filter side of things. And also because uh, at 35 volts, they've got a little more margin for uh, over voltage than the factory caps do. The ones in there are rated at 63 volts, I think, and 25 volts, I do believe. But uh, the 25 volt ones are running at, uh, I think I measured 20 volts. So they're almost already maxed out right there. And then the 63 volt caps are only running at 16 volts. And the reason they're like that is because they're audio grade caps from some weird unknown uh, capacitor supplier. And I decided I would rather just go in with brand new Chemicon KYB parts for all four of those. So that's what's going in there. What else do we have in here? Let's see, these are capacitors. These are some that I didn't have anymore. And in here we've got a couple of relays. There are two relays that need to be swapped on this thing. One deals with the uh, the ultra high speed fast wind. What happens is uh, there's a relay that controls the uh, the speed of the fast wind and either goes between fast or ultra fast. And I decided to just change that out because uh, it's a little inconsistent on this unit and it needs to be done. And then the other relay is for, for source and tape switching. So that's going to get changed out. And that relay can be replaced with the ones that uh, I have been using on on decks like the BX150. It's that same type of relay. I've got 10 of those brand new sitting right behind me. One of those is going to be the, for the TCK55. I just haven't gotten time to put that one in. But uh, I'm actually hoping that these relays, there are two of them in here, will uh, suffice for both the fast wind switching and the uh, tape source switching because these are not the Chinese ones that I've been getting off eBay for the other decks. These are a little better quality, I think. They're still Omron, but uh, I don't know. I just felt like I had to go with a, a more legit source than eBay for, for this particular deck being the special one it is. Next... I've got some O-rings here. These are to fix the door slam issue. And the reason I bought these is because I probably need that very smallest one in this package for the uh, for the door damper on this thing. It takes a quarter inch O-ring and I just didn't have that in any other 
package that I had. So hopefully that'll work if, uh, if nothing else. Next, I've got a brand new FRSP 8.97 belt for the, uh, the uh, capstan drive of this thing. Obviously, being direct drive, the primary capstan doesn't need it, but uh, the supply side capstan will need this one. So, uh, yeah, FRSP 8.97, designed for Nakamichi and other Sankyo transport based uh, direct drive units. So, yeah, it should work. It's not quite the uh, size they say to use with this particular machine. It's supposed to be an FRW 8.8. I've got two of those in case this doesn't work, but uh, this is the first one I'll be trying because it's a little thinner than, uh, than the FRW 8.8s are. So this will be going in there. Now, first thing I'm gonna do on this machine is do capacitors. And we'll talk about those in a second, but I wanna make sure this thing fires up and plays like it did during the initial evaluation. So power on. It's a little hard to uh, see the display in the uh, with these stadium lights I got going on here, but it is working, and it has worked every single other time I've tried this deck. So, cap stands are running. So let's see if it plays without shutting off for a second or five here, because if it needs that uh, issue dealt with, we need to find out that it has the issue first. I need to see what it does when it shuts down like that, if it does at all. So, Dolby C on, type two. Tape is selected and the source tape lighting is still good, so the switching works. And I'll reiterate again from the other video these lamps in here have to be working in order for it to be switched between tape and source. It may be possible to bypass those lamps and have it still work, but uh, yeah, it's best if you just replace them on this thing. So uh, let's see if we get playback. I'm using the YouTube audio library side of my demo tape for this just because I'm kind of getting up there in subscribers and it's not going to be too much longer before I can't get away with the uh, the super rare uh, other stuff I, I like to use. All right, that's three and a half minutes and it hasn't shut down, so I'm light on patience today. What can I tell you? Still working just fine. I can't get it to shut down at all. So I don't know what's going on. We'll try the vaporwave side here real quick. Yeah, I just can't see what's wrong with this, that it, that it would be shutting down, because it hasn't done that once yet for me. But it could. If it does, we'll deal with it. I'm planning on being a little more proactive than reactive, or no, the other way around, reactive than proactive with this thing. Reason being, I cannot find a torque spec for any part of the uh, transport anywhere in the service manual. Instead, the way they have you aligning the, uh, the triple direct drive setup in this is they want you to use an oscilloscope and a uh, millivolt meter, and I do not have the millivolt meter. It's probably going to be the next piece of test equipment I buy, but uh, I was also told in my last video on this that uh, these torque meters don't work with this particular deck because of the direct drive setup. But we're going to use it anyway, or we're going to try it anyway, just to see what happens. I've already done this once, but uh, I just want you to see what the uh, behavior is like with this tape inside this machine, because quite frankly, this thing is already telling me that it's probably working in spec and I don't have to do anything with the uh, direct drive alignment just yet, which is good. So uh, when it comes to recapping the uh, capstan motor board, I think I'm just going to test for the ones that are already bad and only replace those. Everything else will be left as is, I think, just because I don't have that millivolt meter. Okay, let's see what we get for torque. 
Okay, 40 on the take-up side, and it's kind of bouncing around on the uh, supply side between 6 and 10, it looks like. And I was told that it was going to do that, so uh, I think we can call this normal. It's running properly. Glad to see it. So, we'll take out the torque tape, and it's time to get started on capacitors. But before that, I won't do the capacitor service on camera, don't worry. It's going to take me all afternoon if I start it even today, but... I just wanted to talk a little bit about this board up here. This is the playback board. And you might remember that I flagged a couple of Elna capacitors that I didn't really want to keep in here. There's one on this side and there's one over here. Let me shut the power off to the unit before I shock myself. Anyhow, I've been through the service manual and both of those capacitors are in the audio chain for the playback. So if I even get started replacing those two capacitors, I might as well finish up and do the rest of them. And I'm kind of having to think about that. So I'll probably have to sleep on that overnight because I don't have time to get to this capacitant, capacitor swapping job today, but uh, a lot of these capacitors that are used in the playback chain are bipolar, which means I can use my fancy green Nichicon Muse capacitors in this thing, and I think I'm probably going to do that. I know it won't leave the deck stock anymore for the record and playback test, but I think I'm going to do it. Even though this is not a uh, top of the line model, it's a second one from the top of the line, I think this one's going to be worth it. And I've got so many of those capacitors, I need to use them in something. So uh, yeah, I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the uh, audio grade Muse and fine gold caps and the playback and recording boards, but I will probably not use the UKZ parts. A, those UKZs are big, and B, I don't have many of them. So uh, yeah. I'm saving those for a special deck. I don't know what yet, but uh, that's that. All right, so we're back after two or three days. I've finished recapping the uh, control board and the audio chain on both the recording and playback side, and we've got a few things to talk about because I did find some things that might be explaining why this thing was shutting down for its previous owner. First off, I'll just mention right now that I did get this relay replaced. This is the uh, monitor switch relay that was uh, down on the record board down there. And uh, turns out this is a 12 volt relay and the ones that are in here for the uh, fast wind switching are actually 9 volts. So yeah, I had to use the uh, the eBay sourced ones in there for, for that relay, but it's been replaced. Next up, I found a couple of bad capacitors. Surprise, surprise. I'll zoom in here. This one is the 2200 microfarad 25 volt one. It was uh, one of the uh, high stress ones in the uh, power supply for the main filter caps. I'll uh, remind you that these were running at about 21 volts or so, and this one is you can see it here is physically leaking you can see the garbage around this uh, leg right here so yeah and I checked this out also on the multimeter and it's electrically leaking as well what you can do for capacitors is you can put your uh, meter on ohms and uh, measure between this obviously with it discharged first and what should happen is it should go up in resistance until it hits infinity and what this one did is it went up as you would expect it to, but uh, it only went up as high as 10, I think, uh, mega ohms. And uh, once it got to that point, it started drifting backwards, like it started losing resistance. So uh, this is electrically leaky. And this could have been causing the shutdown problems because it's on the uh, main filtering of the power supply. There are four main output voltages. A pair of them were plus or minus 16 volts, and the other pair were plus or minus 21 volts, and this was on the 21 volt side of things. So, uh, yeah, with these running at, or with these specified as 25 volts, 
probably a good thing that I went up to 35 volts on the new caps. So, uh, yeah, I would say go ahead and switch those out for 35 volt parts if you've got one of these. The other one I found that was bad was this one. It wasn't electrically leaky yet, but uh, it was starting to uh, give a little bit of a, uh, a wet spot on the board underneath of it. So, uh, yeah, it, you can't really tell that it's going bad from uh, looking at it like this, and it tests fine. But uh, it is an Elna cap, and I'm glad it's gone. So, yeah, there were other things that I should mention. Let's bring the deck over here. See if I can find it. Nope, can't really find it. This was a point of contention for me, or of concern, I should say. Let's see if I can point it out to you. You see down here, these solenoid wires, they look like they're bare wire. And I thought those were causing the shutdown, but uh, no, as it turns out, the insulation is intact on these and uh, they are not shorting out. I checked it with both multimeters and uh, there's just uh, no problems there. So uh, yeah, so that's fine. But uh, yeah, you can see I've got all four new capacitors in. These are 4700 microfarads at 35 volts, so they're fine. Every capacitor has been done on the control board. And I will show you the audio caps in the audio side of things here. If you'll just give me a second, I gotta desolder this one wire in order to access these. It's not the easiest job I've ever done, I'll tell you what. But it got done. So as you can see, there are a bunch of shiny audio grade capacitors here. We've got the UES parts up here, fine gold here, UKA over here, and uh, down here, these capacitors are also in the power supply. And uh, the original values were 2200 microfarads here and uh, 1000 here, but I didn't have those. Well, I had the 2200s, but... Uh, yeah, I had the 2200s in the wrong value, so uh, these are now, all four of them are Panasonic FRs, and these rear ones are 3300, and these front ones are 2200. So those have gone up in value, but only because I didn't have the correct values. It's nothing to do with anything else. And then you can see down on the record board, I've got a bunch more audio grade capacitors, both UES and fine gold. So, and also a couple of UKA parts down there as well, but uh, hopefully I do not have to go in and uh, reset my uh, record levels, but I may have to. We'll just have to see on that one, but uh, for now it's time to start getting into the transport. And in order to do that, we've got to desolder some of Sony's uh, usual heads here, because they like to solder them down trying to give you a look so you can see what I'm doing. I'm not real good left-handed with the iron, but I'm gonna have to do it that way this time. And I've already taken pictures so I know where these go. And I gotta tell you guys, I have now run this thing for a couple of days now. I played uh, two 90-minute tapes on it without stopping. And it played them without stopping. So the shutoff problem, if there ever was one, is gone. It works just fine. Okay, so we got those head wires freed up, and we've got others we're going to have to deal with under here. Because in order to get the transport out, we need to free up all of the wires. And I will see if I can do so. It's really hard to get access in here. Just trying to figure out which ones are the head wires, and I think these are the ones down here. I'll show them to you real quick so you can see, and also so I can reference the video backwards. They're just right down in here. One's going to be the erase head, and one's going to, er, and one's going to be for both playback or both record heads. I should say. You'll have to excuse me. My brain's a little discombobulated today. 
Now, according to the service manual, you have to take the uh, front panel off before you can uh, get the transport out. So we'll do that now. I've already had the front panel off because uh, I needed the access to get in there and uh, get at some of those capacitors. And you have to watch out because uh, they've got these shims in these screws for the top panel here. There's three of them, one under each of these three screws. So don't lose those. They will be in there. They won't look like they're in there because Sony put them in backwards, but uh, they're in there, trust me. And while we're doing this, I will also mention that the uh, Bayer Dynamic headphones are in. And man, that is something I should have done a long time ago. My Pro Audio days are well behind me, and in that intervening time, it appears that my ears have just kind of drifted off of, uh, or out of spec for, for that kind of thing. I used to be able to tune an EQ systems just by ear, and apparently not having access to decent reproductive gear all these years have kind of blunted my ability to do that. And those headphones, I'm going to tell you right now, are so freaking good. Am I losing track of things here? I hope not. Anyway, yeah, they're so good that not only have I had to re-rank all my top five cassette decks, and if you want to know where they rank now, check out the video, video description. But uh, they have also told me some surprising things about my other gear. Like I thought the camber speakers in the uh, office weren't good enough for uh, this kind of work. Well, turns out they are. The problem, as it turns out, is with the Pioneer receiver I've been using to drive the camber speakers. <coughs> See, Pioneer's room correction software, in its infinite wisdom, decided, apparently, that uh, I had no need of anything above 8 kilohertz. So I went in, and I saw that the uh, values were uh, plus 4 or plus 5 decibels for the 8 kilohertz band, and it had the... Uh, 16 kilohertz band attenuated by 3.5 decibels. That is massive. No wonder I couldn't hear anything above 8 kilohertz in there. So I fixed that real quick. I dropped 8 kilohertz by, by half a decibel and I bumped 16 up 3.5 decibels. And the next thing you know, those VIFA tweeters and those speakers are sparkling again. And uh, yours truly can now tell the difference between a FLAC file and an MP3 in there now. That's how good the Bayer Dynamics are. They're still better than the uh, Camber speakers, but uh, not by a whole lot. So, yeah, we should have access to the transport now. I don't know what all I'm going to have to uh, disconnect here, but there will be something, I'll tell you that. Get rid of these zip ties. This apparently was a smoker's deck, so uh, yeah, I'm having to deal with that as well. And the other thing I have to recap yet is the headphone board down in this area. I'll do that with the transport out. Okay, transport is loose, but we're gonna have to uh, disconnect some more stuff. In order to fully remove it. Just trying to figure out what I need to disconnect here. I'm trying not to break the uh, magnet wires on the uh, playback solenoid, which is what I just showed you early, earlier. Uh, 
Okay, it's just trying to figure out which wires go where and do what. That is the issue here. So uh, let me go off camera real quick and I'll get this out and we'll proceed. All right, so the transport is out and uh, we're gonna have to get this servo board off the back of it in order for me to uh, check some of the capacitors and uh, obviously replace this one with the bad circuit glue. And oh, that's the other thing. There was a lot of bad circuit glue on this underneath the control board. Underneath that board, Sony had these two capacitors encased in electrical tape and then circuit glued in. And that circuit glue was uh, covering a whole lot of pins under there, so that could have been causing the shutdown issue as well. But uh, what we have here is a pair of uh, 100 microfarad capacitors back to back to make one bipolar 50 microfarad cap. And I've got new capacitors in there now. And uh, instead of using Sony's idea of uh, electrical tape and, uh, and whatnot, I went in with actual heat shrink. So uh, yeah, should be much better now. Anyway, we've got this one connector that I've already unplugged and we're gonna have to detach these uh, FG servo wires here. So make sure you note where, they, where these go back. And uh, I have already taken a picture of these so I know where they go. But uh, we have to uh, do this they're actually kind of labeled here. It's got an FG label right next to this one. Anyway, we have to do this in order to uh, get access to the uh, capstans and capstan bearings and all that good stuff. But uh, we should have access now. And yes, we do. And we've got a couple of insulating washers on here that we'll have to take note of. And this board back here is going to be for the uh, the uh, capstan motors themselves. Not sure if I need to remove that or not. I'm a little concerned about these uh, magnet wires on the uh, solenoid back here. This is what controls the uh, the playhead. I will probably desolder those and I might check them again before I, they go back on to make sure that they're not shorting out, but uh, yes, at least now I can get access to the uh, capacitors on the uh, servo board and see how many are good and change out this relay and all that other good stuff. And I'll show you the other new tool that just showed up. I got one of these tweezer things for checking capacitors, so that's going to help. Maybe. And I should also mention that uh, I've checked all three of these using the IR camera in the new multimeter and they're not running hot at all. They're like 43 degrees they're running at, so that's completely fine for those. I see an Elna capacitor right there, I think. Actually, more than one. I will have to check those. More than likely, I will just replace them. Okay, there's another one over here. So, let me get to that and then we'll pick up after that. All right, so I'm done with the capacitors, I think, on this board. Didn't have too many to do, but uh, there are some areas of concern. One is these two here, this one and this one. These are 4.7 microfarad bipolar. The ones that were in here were 50 volts and these are 35 volts. I'm not sure if these will work, but they should because uh, according to the service manual, they've got plus or minus 16 volts on them. So I guess we'll have to see. And then I also changed this one. It didn't test bad, but it's right next to this big heat sink here. And uh, yeah, I decided to go ahead and swap that with a 105 degree capacitor instead so hopefully that should be done if i have to recap the rest of these i will but uh, you'll notice that uh, most of the ones i used here there are four in total are ues muse capacitors and that's because 
I just did not have the bipolar capacitors in these values except in Muse. So, uh, yeah, it's got audio grade caps on the uh, servo board. It doesn't need them, but it's got them. And then on the other side, you can see what I did here for this one. I have some PFTE tubing, at least I think that's what it's called. I use that to insulate the one leg of it, and uh, I've also uh, sort of uh, put the capacitor off down to the bottom here, just so it's away from the hot IC, so hopefully that'll work. But uh, in the meantime, it's time to get to the actual transport side of things, so I'm going to put this servo board off to the side, and we're going to work on this. Now what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to desolder these uh, these uh, coil wires here just so they're out of the way. And while I have found evidence that somebody had been inside this deck before, I'm not 100% sure on that one. That may be the case, that may not be the case, I'm not sure. There we go. So those should be out of harm's way now. And hopefully we can take this uh, plate off so we can get in here and start working on the stuff that's inside here. Now, let me see. Check my shot here. And we'll start getting in there. Okay, it's already ready to come up. We'll just set it down like this. And now we can see the actual direct drive motor for the uh, cap stands. Not seeing too many areas of concern. Grease definitely needs to be redone. But what else is new? And I should mention that I've already checked the uh, the thrust on these bearings and they're inside uh, factory specifications, so I'm not going to worry about that. Now off comes the belt. Definitely time for replacement. It does feel a little hard. Let me measure it real quick if I can find my uh, calipers, which are hiding right in front of me in plain sight. Try and see what this measures. Okay, there it is, 117.5 millimeters or 4.62 inches, so very definitely stretched. Now let me get my special new belt real quick. I want to see how it fits. Oh yeah, I think that's going to work just fine. And I'll remind you this is an FRSP 8.97. So I'm going to put this back away temporarily because we got to get the, uh, the doohickeys out. I'm just checking here to see where all these wires go, just in case I need to uh, do something with those. But I'm just going to go ahead and pull these out, I think. We'll set them up off to the side here. Got a washer over here. It's kind of a thick washer also. There's a washer here, it looks like. Yes. I'll set that next to its cab stand. And this here would be part of the uh, coil assembly for that motor. So I want to gain access to what's underneath it, I think, 
or do I? So in order to do that, I'm gonna have to uh, get on in under there. And I'm gonna tell you right now, this is a little bit stressful. Cause I've never dealt with anything like this deck before. Okay, nothing too fancy under there. Got a little hole here that corresponds to uh, this post there. So we'll have to keep that in mind. And where can I set this so it won't cause problems? I'll just try and leave it up top there, I think. And I hope you can see what I'm doing here because uh, it's really not that easy to line up a shot with this. Got some grease to clean up here, not too much. I had a feeling this was going to be a fairly simple uh, transport to service, but uh, getting access to some of these parts is not that simple. I'll tell you that right now. And that should be all I need to do under here, I think. Well, except for uh, the stuff up there. But we'll deal with that by and by. Actually, even the grease seems good on the uh, head block, so I may not have to do a lot with this, which is a nice change for me and Sony. Well, there's a washer I can't account for. It's the way it always goes. It's probably an oil control washer. That's usually the way it goes. Which means there's probably another one here somewhere. I'm just gonna check and see if this is in fact a... No, it isn't. It's something else. I'm probably going to have to go back to the service manual to figure out where that goes. Okay, folks, there are no oil keeper washers for this thing. I checked my footage. They don't exist. So I'm going to officially assume that this washer goes with the other one that went on the uh, supply side capstan. So uh, it's time to clean some capstan bearings and capstans and all that wonderful stuff. So uh, let me get my acetone, and we will commence doing so. And don't worry, we're getting to the damper stuff. A couple of cotton pipe cleaners in the acetone. I'll just push them through the other side if I can grab them here and thankfully I can we're going in with all new oil so no worries about that come on little buddy go through there you go uh, that one pulled out some crud and I'll remind you that this thing tested really high for a while in flutter, so, or rather higher than it should have, so that could have been the cause of that. And what am I doing putting the acetone away? We've got capstans and flywheels to clean. Okay, we'll do this side first. squeaky clean. I see a lot of build up on the flywheel so yeah, I might have to use some abrasive action to get some of that off. Lots of stuff coming off though already. Yeah, there's still some crud on this thing that's not coming off with the acetone. 
and you wonder why I keep my f fingernails long. It's for stuff like this, and uh, even that isn't doing it. These have to be clean if you want the best wow and flutter. And even that didn't do it. All right, where's my scotch bright? Just trying to get that little speck of dirt off there. Still doesn't want to come. And I don't want to use anything more harsh than what I'm using right now, so I'm not going to. Just got to keep working it till it goes. And it's gone. Huzzah! One last little cleaning with the uh, acetone paper towel. Man, I hope this thing works when I get done with it, because uh, this is one of the more complicated decks I've ever serviced. That's probably about as good as I'll get that one. Taking a bit to get this one clean, too. But again, this is why I'm not servicing consumers' decks yet. I need to make sure I know what I'm doing for every deck I have before I start trying to fix other people's decks. At least that would be my plan. And there's a lot of gunk on this flywheel too, so let me clean this up and uh, we'll pick up again. Alright, so I think I got the uh, capstans clean enough to the point I can actually start reinstalling things. Got a little scotch bright material inside the uh, this area of this capstan. That would not have been ideal. But we'll go in with the Anderall 456 and uh, get some fresh oil in these capstans. or capstan bearings, I should say. Don't want to use too much, as I found out the hard way with the A&D machine. Oh, I got a little bit of pipe cleaner stuff inside the bearing here. A little bit of fuzz. Nothing too serious. I don't know if you can see any of that, but uh, I am just inserting some oil into the front bearings here. And now I should be able to uh, Reinstall yonder cap stands. I realize it's hard to see because I was kind of blocking you there, but I'm just making sure there's enough lube in here. Seems like that one's freewheeling well enough, so might be okay here. I can just get this one in. Like so. I think we're good on that end. So I want to clear, clean the, the rear of the cap stands here where the bearings go and we should be ready for the new belt now and there we be
Now we get some more molly coat. And put some on the thrust bearings. Don't want to do too much, but uh, it's kind of hard to uh, get these to behave sometimes. All right, looks pretty good, except for the fact that uh, the belt now needs to go over or under this metal bracket here right there. Hopefully you can see that. But it's in place now. I do believe. So we should be done the back side of the transport now and we can move on to the front side. I'm not going to reinstall the servo board just yet. I don't want it damaged. Because that would be really bad, because uh, it took me months to find one of these decks. So I would just as soon rather be careful. Just checking to be sure this wire doesn't interfere with the uh, flywheels at all. It seems like it's a little tight in there. If I'm being honest. It might be okay. We'll see. I don't need this to outperform my other decks for a while and flutter. Especially with those big JVCs sitting on the shelf back there. We will reconnect the solenoid wires now. And the other thing is I might have to get back in here as well to uh, do more stuff with the uh, capacitors. And these little fine wires just kind of bother me. Let me see if I can get some PFTE tubing on that. Just for a little extra insulation. Well, I'll never see that piece again. make sure I can sneak this wire through. It's very fine wire. That is probably going to be too thick. Or too much. I should say not too thick. It doesn't look like it's going to go back into the black insulation, so... Uh, well, if my gigantic thumbs will help me do this. We'll see if we can thread the needle here. Or there, a little bit of peace of mind. Okay. I gotta solder that somehow with my shaky hands. Yeah, there's still a little bit of an area where that's not quite insulated, but... Well, I say not quite insulated, but it's probably insulated. It's just covered is what I mean. And you can see how far in this wire is tin. This one wire right here, it's got a quarter inch of tinning on it, so uh, it could be that there's a little bit too much insulation missing from this one. 
So let me check my PFTE tubing one more time. Make sure it's open on both ends. And we will insulate this one too. Oh, would you look at that? It does go all the way into the, uh, the black insulation. But what I will also do after this is I've got some Kapton tape and I will use that to further insulate here. That's if I can find the stuff. All right, that should do the job, I think. And because these are coil wires, it doesn't matter which way you solder them in. So don't worry about polarity. I'm going to make sure these don't cause a problem, is what I'm going to do. Be great if I had the right tools for the job, but uh, my scissors done went missing, so no chance of that. Okay, hopefully that does the job. It should. Now, the damper. What does I need to do for that? Yeah, the grease on the head block isn't great, but it's quite probably good enough. I might want to do something about that, but uh, in the meantime, we have to do something about the uh, damper. If we can figure out how to get to it. So, why don't we remove our beauty plate here first. I don't think I'm going to need to do anything with these uh, direct drive reels here. If I can release the brakes on them, I can figure out whether or not they're uh, moving freely. But uh, to do that, I think I'm going to have to uh, pull the uh, beauty plate off first. Off it comes, and now we can look at the uh, direct drive reels for the first time. Check that out. Isn't that awesome? But uh, yeah, let me check the, uh, the lube on the reels first. Oh yeah, they're fine. They are just fine, which is good because I don't want to have to uh, deal with the uh, nightmare it looks like that I'll have to deal with if I want to get in there. And yeah, I think I'm going to leave the head block alone. It's well lubed enough. At least that's what I'm going to say for now. Just cleaning the oil off the camp stands. And we'll have to take a look at the, uh, the heads as well. I think I've already done that, however, in the last video. And I'll tell you right now that the uh, sound quality I'm getting out of this leads me to believe there is no issue at all with the heads. I think they're in perfect shape. Okay, what do I need to do to get further into this? I want to take the door off. Because I think I need to in order to get access to this damper. Okay, so I've had a look and the damper is apparently clipped in right over here. So it should be possible to get that unclipped and then uh, remove it. So we'll have to see if I can do that here without breaking something. That does not want to come out. So let's do this another way. Let's come at it from this angle. It may be possible to do this without messing with that at all. Oh, 
Oh yeah, there's like no damping grease whatsoever left in there. And uh, here's the O-ring we're going to have to replace. But before that, let me get my damping grease. I bought this stuff for this. I don't know if it's the right stuff to use because it's 300,000 viscosity, but uh, yeah. So uh, what do we do first? Well, first off, I'm going to put some damping grease inside the uh, damper assembly. And good lord, look at how thick this stuff is. It's like goo, just about. It's silicone snot is what it is. I'm just going to coat the inside of this. We don't want to use too much of this stuff either, because... Uh, It'll block off the hole and then you won't get any damping action. So hopefully that does the trick. I'm going to leave it out for now because we got to get this uh, O-ring out of there. No wonder this thing had a door slam issue. Okay, there's our O-ring. Where is my package of O-rings that I bought for this thing? Right in front of my face, apparently. Okay, this one looks like it's about the same size. because it is the same size and I don't think this other o-ring is that bad really it's hard and stuff but it's not real bad and that was actually the second smallest one I used so we'll see if this works real quick here Oh yeah, I can feel it much better. Maybe that was the right damping grease to get. We will find out shortly. All right, let's see how fast it opens now. Oh yeah, I can live with that. It's a little bit quick yet, but uh, let me try a tape. We'll see what it's like with a tape. Got hung up there, the tape did. Why is the tape getting hung up? I don't think it's quite happy with the way things are in there just yet. I just got oil on my tape. How did I do that? Don't answer that. Yes, I am quite happy with that. So that's fixed, relatively. Just trying to figure out just how much further I want to go on in this deck. Pinch rollers look great. Yeah, I think we're just going to leave it at this. I could live to regret that. Probably will, but... Uh, this video has taken quite some time to get going, so... I want you guys to be able to see it. And what I'm doing right now is I'm cleaning the pinch rollers. Cause that's how that tape got some oil on it. I realize this video is not going to be as thorough as uh, 
Some of my others have been, but this deck needs less than most of my other decks have. I will tell you how to get at the uh, headlock if you need to get at it. Because I believe I can do that. So in order to get the headlock assembly out, what you would have to do is you would have to remove this board back here with the uh, with the two uh, direct drive reels and in order to get those out you have to take the door off. And uh, I think the easiest way to do that is to just let the uh, damper pull right out of the cylinder. Let's check it one more time. Yeah, I'm happy with that. But uh, yeah, in order to get the uh, direct drive reels out, you would have to uh, get this out and get this bracket off on this side. So yeah, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to clean the heads and I'm going to put this back together, I think. But yeah, this thing's got some real treble going with it. I've listened to two tapes on it now, and it's got almost as much treble as the GXZ9100 has. So hopefully it records relatively the same way. I don't know that this deck is going to be in my top five. It seems to be lacking something on the bottom end of the audio spectrum, so uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see. Just take one more look at these pinch rollers here. I want to make sure that I'm not giving up too early on this thing. I'm looking for cracks. They're moving well, so no lubrication needed in there. I do have pinch rollers if it needs them in the future, but it does not need them now. So, yeah, I guess I'll put this back together. Rather, after I put the beauty plate back on, we'll put it back together. Then we'll see where she's at. And if I have to get back in here to service the headlock, at some future date, I will. But uh, as after all that stuff I did on the uh, servo board, I just want to make sure this thing works now before I even try to do anything else on it. So I'm going to shut you off now, and I'll put it back together, and we'll see what happens. Okay, folks, it's back together, and we're going to see if I broke something more or if I have to uh, get back in there or what. I'm still not sure about those 35-volt capacitors, but uh, if I'm understanding the service manual right, it should be fine. So uh, let's see if we got anything. Power on. No capstan. Great. What did I screw up? Did I forget to connect something? It's usually what happens. What could I have possibly forgotten? Did I forget anything? Let me check this out and I'll get back to you. Well, folks, I don't know. I've been over and over this thing and I can't figure out why the, the uh, capstan motor is not starting. Literally looked at every single thing I've done on this thing and I just can't find it. I don't know what's going on and I may never know what's going on. <sighs> I'm so frustrated right now. I did find a piece of capacitor lead inside the FG coil where it shouldn't have been so I pulled that out. Hasn't changed a dang thing. It does feel like there is some uh, some type of action going on in there when I turn it on. It feels like there's some kind of magnetic force in there that I don't feel when it's turned off, like right now. And I think I've seen that thing twitch a little bit, but uh, it's powered up right now. And uh, yeah, I can feel it acting on the uh, on the uh, flywheels but I can't get the dang thing to actually start, so I don't know what's going on with it. Anyhow, in the process of all this, I managed to short this thing out on the power switch, so I blew the fuse in the in the 100 volt step down transformer too, so thankfully with the new caps I put in this thing, it's fine with 125 volts directly, but 
still, I don't know where to go from here. So I'm going to come back to this on Saturday, maybe see if I can figure something out. But for today, I'm quitting. Well, folks, I don't know what to tell you guys. I've been over this and over this and over this again, and I cannot find the issue as to why the capstan motor is not running. It's just not apparent at all. And uh, I am, as I go along here, I am starting to uh, think more and more that uh, this issue is coincidental to me servicing the transport and is, has actually nothing to do with me actually servicing the transport. Even though I did find a piece of component lead stuck in the FG coil, which has now been removed, but uh, I don't know, that's been removed now and uh, it just seems like nothing is working properly. So we're gonna go through and uh, get some waveforms on the scope together and I'll show you exactly what I'm getting. Okay, let's see, have I got power? Yes, I've got power. Power is on, and we're going to go right to, uh, oh, let's see here, pin 2 of IC003. This is where I suspect the problem is. You see this waveform here? That's exactly what we should be getting. Thirty two point eight kilohertz, three point nine volts peak to peak. That's what it should be. And the same thing goes with pin three here. It's right there. And from there it goes from pin three it goes to R007, which is a one mega ohm resistor that I just changed out. And I'm getting the same thing at one side and at the other side I'm getting well it's there, but it's How about I go the right way? Yeah, it's 204 millivolts there. It should be about one volt, but it is there. So, pin five is the output to IC001. So what do we have there? Well, it looks like we've got DC voltage there. I think. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing here. I had something there a minute ago. And I'm checking the wrong one. Okay. This is IC003. This is what I'm getting on that pin 5 there. That is not correct. Peak to peak voltage is 1.84 volts, but uh, when I go into the horizontal, I cannot actually discern where that uh, frequency is because it keeps doing this, you see. And it shouldn't be doing that. It should be doing a regular waveform. I'll show you what it looks like. It's right here. That's what that waveform should look like, and we're not getting that. So, uh, yeah, I'm coming down to the uh, conclusion here that IC003 is dead and needs to be replaced. Unfortunately, said IC is unobtainium. So, uh, yeah, I think this is probably going to be the end of the story with this deck, unfortunately. Paid way too much for it, and... Yeah, I'm starting to think this design is too complicated for its own good, so I don't know what's going to happen when I get to the uh, TCK777. And oh, by the way, I should mention right now that the TCK, TCK777, that is the one that shares heads with the TCK75. It's not this one. Yeah, for now I have to call it quits on this one and I have to put it back on the shelf and uh, move on to other units. I've just only got so much time I can spend on these things, so, uh, yeah, maybe I'll find a new IC003 along the way somewhere and I can try that or whatever, and, or maybe somebody else out there has some ideas on what to check next, but, uh, yeah, 
I'm really not sure at this point whether IC003 is bad or not, but uh, it's starting to look that way. Well, folks, there it is. We are back in business. And I cannot believe what the problem actually was. After all that stressing out over that IC and not being able to find a replacement and possibly having to face the idea of going in and asking other people with electronics engineering backgrounds in order to help me pick a new IC for this thing, it turned out to be extremely simple. And I'm thanking the, my lucky stars right now that I'm doing this on YouTube, otherwise I wouldn't have had the video footage necessary for me to find this problem. As it turns out, when I removed the uh, cap stands for servicing, there was one washer that fell out and I didn't know where it went initially. It was a really thick washer and I thought it had come out of the supply side, but no, it came out of the cap stand or out of the take up side where the motor is. And there was already a really thick washer back in there that I assumed was the only one. And no, apparently it needs both washers and they have to be there. Otherwise this motor will not start. There's something critical about those two washers that just requires them to be there. It wasn't an issue of the uh, flywheel binding up on the uh, FG coil at all. It was uh, just the fact that it didn't have the spacing or something that it should have had. But as you can see, the capstan motor is back, the deck is back playing again, and I am going to call it quits right now because uh, I need to go buy a, a lottery ticket or something. Okay, so... I apologize that we're not doing the wow and flutter thing yet, but I realized last night that uh, something very important was skipped that I have to get done. And I skipped it because I just kind of lost my head a bit around that capstan motor issue. But uh, we have to uh, clean these uh, tape type selection switches before we do any kind of uh, record play test with this thing. So we're gonna do that on camera now. And as you can see, I've already got one of these things apart. I wanted to do it just to uh, re-familiarize myself with these types of switches. But uh, as I'm fi finding out, it is actually possible to uh, do this with the switches in place. You don't have to take them off the board. And that's kind of a good thing, if I'm being honest, because uh, I'll show you. There's this little catch down here. This is part of the... Uh, the sliding lac latching mechanism that uh, enables each switch to uh, to uh, latch like that. And the problem is, if you try to pry these switches up off the board without dealing with this latching mechanism, you will break that latching mechanism. There's a little metal bar that goes in underneath all four switches. And there's a spring right under here that you would have to be careful of as well. And we're probably going to have to watch out for that when we get to those switches as well. Or I will. Because I'll be doing that off camera. But um, basically we're going to deal with this one switch here. This is the metal type switch. And uh, yeah, that's the one we need to do the record and play test on. So uh, we're going to just deal with that on camera. And I will show you how these are made. If I can. They're made using these, come on, focus. There's four of these little teeny tiny contacts under each one. And don't worry about putting them back in place because uh, I'll just show you here. This is the sliding part that goes into the switch like so. And uh, basically, you can't really put these in wrong, you just, whoops, let me get another one here. They fit into, man, I'm butterfingers today. I'll just do this with my fingers and not worry about the tweezers. This is how they go in. You see there's these big notches here for each one of those. So you just gotta line those up and you're fine. But uh, we gotta clean this first because it is dirty. Trust me, see if I can get you a 
a look-see. Probably not, but they are quite dirty. This would not have uh, fared well in the uh, record play test if I left it alone. So I got my Deoxit D100L here. We're going to use that. If these switches were any worse, I would want to go in with acetone instead, possibly. But you can't use acetone on the uh, this side of it because uh, plastic, you know. So uh, yeah, I think we're going to get off lucky and have the uh, D100L do the trick here. So I'm going to apply some and I'm going to grab a Q-tip and we're just going to go in and scrub the contacts. Eh, uh, not too dirty. When these switches get really bad, sometimes you need to polish them rather than uh, do it this way. I don't know, this one might actually be at that point. That one there is not coming clean. There is a uh, protective coating on these contacts, mind you. So it's best not to polish that coating off. Well, I'll hit it a couple more times with the D100L and we'll see where that gets us. This time I'm just going to apply it to the Q-tip itself. It is still bringing some dirt up. And I can see it getting cleaner. So yeah, I think this is all we're going to have to do. And the other thing you want to watch for is if you're going to use Q-tips like this, you got to watch that there's no fuzz left over inside the switch. Looking much better, but I'm having trouble getting into the uh, middle section of the switch, so I'm going to go to my uh, microfiber swabs for the insides. Let me get in close and have a look. I think I will call that good enough. And we will have to deal with the other side of the contacts now. And to do that, I'm going to get a piece of paper. I'll just tear off a little bit of paper here. And hopefully we can give you a nice good look at this. I'm going to fold the paper in half. Coat it in the D100L like so. I'll take my little contacts. And just use the paper to scrub them. And look how much crud is coming off that. Just this way. That was a dirty contact for sure. Come on, get off my finger. And this is where I would be using the acetone if I were using it. And I'll tell you right now that the uh, JVC D99 has these same switches as well, and they are all bad on that one. Every single one of them. In fact, they're, I can guarantee you right now that they're much worse than this deck has. On that one, we're going to have to actually polish the contacts with polishing compound. It's not going to work to do it just with the D100L, I can tell you that right now. But we'll deal with that when it comes time to deal with it. And I'll tell you right now, you remember how I was talking about wanting another D99? Well, I found one. It's in possibly even worse shape than the one I have. But I'm still seriously considering it because I'm thinking parts deck. All right, that's good enough. Look at all the crap that came off of those. 
Now, I would show you how to put this switch together right now, but uh, before we do that, we have to get the, other, the next switch apart because it's gonna be easier to do it now. So I'm gonna take the switch pieces from this switch, group them all together so I don't lose them. Then I'll show you how to get into the next switch to do this. And before we put any of these switches back together, I'm gonna leave a uh, coating of D100L in there just to lubricate and uh, make happy, hopefully. Okay, now the first thing we're gonna wanna do is take these clips off so we can remove the spring. Be very gentle with this. And have a lot of patience. and then let them go flying. I heard where it went. I'll find it. And yes, I found it. Okay, so the spring is released. Now we gotta bend these tabs up top here. So they're vertical. All right, now that should be able to come up now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to very gently press upwards on the uh, sliding part, not hard, gently. And I'm just gonna wiggle the switch off or the top of the switch off like so. And you're gonna find that there is a little catch on the back of this thing like uh, right there. It'll make you think that you have to pry it from the back, but no, do it from the front like I just did. And then now we can take this off and we can see where the contacts go. But yeah, that's how you get those apart. Now, because I've gotten that one apart, we can reassemble the one we just cleaned. I'll just grab the contacts out of the Type 3 switch first. Put them aside. I'm going to go back in with a microfiber swab and I'm going to make sure the metal switch has no fibers in it. And it does not. So we're gonna D100L this switch permanently. That's probably too much, but that's okay. Now, tweezers. If I can hold on to the dad gum contacts this time, that'd be great. Ah, I still can't get them with the tweezers. Okay, I got one in. These things are so fiddly, I tell you what. But be patient, you'll get them. Now we put the... Uh, I better get my uh, enclosure housing ready. And we are just going to reinstall the housing. If we can.
Okay, I think we're good. Except for the fact that I forgot to put the spring back on. So yeah, don't forget your springs, guys. They're important. Okay, now we'll do it. Okay, now we reinstall the uh, spring keeper, which is going to be a fight. I can just tell that right now. So we got to compress the spring in order to do that. All right, that switch looks to be back together, but it's binding up. Why is it binding up? Spring out of position. Like I said, take your time. Be patient, it'll go. It'll do what you want. Then the tabs back. And it's locked up again. Why is it locked up again? Spring is still out of position. There we go. Perfect. No further problems. At least uh, there shouldn't be any further problems. All right, folks, before we move on to the wow and flutter stuff, I wanted to uh, make you aware of a little bit of a gotcha this thing has going on. If you don't have these little spring retainers in perfectly, let me zoom in. If you don't have them sitting perfectly, they will bind up on this plate up here and then the, you won't get any button action. As you can see, they're all working. However, I did manage to deform one of the contacts in the Type 3 switch, so I don't know if that switch is going to work properly now, but I did manage to get it uh, reformed well enough to go back in and work, hopefully, but uh, since that's on the Type 3 switch, I don't care if it works. The rest of them are fine. So yeah, it goes without saying that when you're working around contacts like that, you have to be extremely careful with them. I was, and I still managed to deform one, but uh, it's the only one. Anyhow, everything should be working now. I think, I hope. I haven't cleaned this control yet, the record level control. I'm going to leave it because it's a gigantic sealed unit that uh, I don't really want to get into right now, but uh, I will mention that... Uh, this switch, the Type 1 switch, that was the dirtiest of all four. That one was black in places, so uh, I decided to go ahead and do the polishing on this one only. And I kind of wish I'd done that on all the remaining switches because now this one's in the best shape and it's flawless now. I got a picture of it, I'll show you. But uh, yeah, those should be done now. So let me put the front back on and we'll start getting into the wild flutter stuff and we'll check and see if these buttons work. Okay, folks, one more modification I've done on the 666ES that you need to know about. I found that the power switch was doing too much popping and crackling when I was switching it on. And I'm blaming this on A, my new main filter caps, which are double the capacitance of the original ones. But also B, Sony didn't install what is called a snubber capacitor in this thing. For whatever reason, it's not in the schematics for any version of this deck. But as you can see, it's got one now. Basically what this is, is it's a comp is it's a blah, 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 blah. That's what it is. 
No, it's a uh, capacitor and a resistor in one package. This one's 0 0.33 microfarads plus a 120 ohm resistor. And what this does is it helps to suppress the arcing inside the power switch when you switch the unit on. And this one's from my TCK61 parts deck. Otherwise, I would have had to order one, and these can kind of get expensive. But anyway, it's got one now, and it's solved the problem. It's not popping anymore at all, so... Saved ourselves a power switch there. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to suggest if you decide to get one of these from Japan for the North American market, and you intend on powering it up regularly with the 120 volt line voltage here, I would say get yourselves one of these and install it. Heck, just do it anyway. It's good practice. And these are dedicated products specifically designed for this purpose. They're uh, safety rated for handling our voltage, so you have to make sure you get one that's uh, CSA or UL approved or whatnot. So yeah, just get it one or two from DigiKey. They do cost a bit, but uh, it's worth the peace of mind. And I should mention, Sony actually did install a capacitor in here. It's back here, but it's a little too far away from the power switch to actually be effective. And there's no built-in resistor in that one. Let's see if I can get you in there to see it. Yeah, it's about the same thing. It's a, compa it's a capacitor, but there's no internal resistor. And it's so far away from the power switch, it basically does nothing. So I'm happy with this. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to get some, uh, some of my uh, red silicone sealant out and I'm just going to sort of tack this onto the power switch so it stays put. But uh, yeah, that's what I did there. Okay folks, we're going to have a look at the wow and flutter now. I've looked at the service manual and uh, there is an adjustment on there that says capstan duty cycle. And on the servo board it says speed. So I'm thinking this may be one of those rare quartz lock decks that uh, actually have speed adjustment, but it's not clear to me right now, but we're gonna find that out shortly. If I can find my test tape. And I'll tell you right now, I have played half of a tape on this and I'm getting a popping in the audio consistent with uh, static discharge. I don't know what's causing that. It could be the tape I was playing because that tape has probably not been played in like 20 years or so. Probably even longer than that. I didn't hear it with the other tape I was trying to play, but uh, we could see it today in the uh, Wow and Flutter results. So keep an eye out. If it if it happens, you, you will see it and you'll know it. But uh, I should also tell you, I've discovered this thing has a panel lamp or not a panel lamp, a uh, cassette well lamp. I didn't even notice it. It's one of those axial micro lamps of the same type that's used in the tape source switch. And of course, mine's burned out. I'm not sure if I'm going to be replacing that. I've got LEDs, I might try that. That might be a future thing. We can deal with that with the static popping or whatever at the same time, maybe, I don't know. But if the static popping happens now, I think what I'm going to do is, after the wound flutter test, I'll run a couple of tapes through this thing and we'll see if it clears up or not. And then I'll do the record and play test. And then, yeah, I don't know. I just need to be done with this. It's been a couple of weeks now since I started working on this, so... Anyhow, I've got the RSB755's speed calibration tape in, so we're going to find out now what the wound flutter looks like. Let's find out. Well, that's not correct. I do have the ability to uh, set this duty cycle control the way the service manual wants you to do it. However, it looks like I've just about got it dialed in right now. Could be that control was just a little dirty. 
That could have been causing the popping issue, maybe. I don't know. I'd like to think it did. But, uh, yeah. I don't know if I want to touch it from here, actually. It's running acceptably well. 3,003 hertz. 0.05% wound flutter. I can live with that. Remember, the belt hasn't been broken in yet, so uh, you don't know. It could dial itself in further, and it looks like it is, actually. 0 0.047. I don't need this one to make speed test tapes with. That's what I've got the JVC decks for. But, uh, yes, I'm happy with this. We're going to leave it right there. And I'm not seeing any signs of popping in the audio. So yeah, it could be the uh, capstan duty cycle control here was dirty and causing the popping noise. I don't know. We'll watch it for a second here. I'll remind you that when I tested it before service, we got 3008 hertz. So it's running a little slower than it was before. But it's closer to being on the right target frequency. I like this. I like this a lot. I'm really seeing no signs of that popping noise, so it might be gone. I'm going to shut it off now and hope that's the end of it for that. But like I said, I'll listen to it for a couple of tapes and I'll see if that noise is actually gone. And I will say that I did fiddle with that capstan duty cycle control while I was trying to get the capstan motor to run again, so that might be part of the problem. Anyway, let me rewind this tape here. And yeah, like I said, I will uh, go off camera for a couple of tapes, see if that popping noise comes back, maybe see if I can find an excuse for it. I checked all the grounds in the deck, they're fine. And yeah, if the popping noise is gone, we'll do the record and play test and you'll get to see how this thing sounds for the first time. And oh, I forgot to show you. Tape type switching is working perfectly. I'm not sure I want to uh, fiddle with the type 3 switch too often because it could break. But I've also noticed in the service manual there's a redundant contact in there. so. Uh, I might be able to fix it anyway if it breaks, so. See, it is switching properly. But uh, it's only switching properly in the display. I don't know if the EQ is switching properly. We'll have to find that out in the record play test. Anyhow, yeah, we'll keep going with this deck, see if we can get it working perfectly. The cassette well light, I'll show it to you. I didn't notice it because it's in behind this piece right here. I can't show it to you very well because it's inside the deck right now, but uh, it's in there, trust me. But uh, yeah, I'm getting closer and closer to the end of this, I think, but uh, who knows? I might have to deal with that uh, popping issue, but uh, yeah. I did notice the wow and flutter sounded off while I was playtesting it this morning with the popping noise. But uh, yeah, we know why that why that happened now. That's because the, uh, the speed slash duty cycle control was dirty. So yeah, hopefully everything should be cleaned up now and cleared up. And hopefully this deck is 100% now, except for the cassette well light. I'm going to have to find sources for those lamps eventually because once these burn out, I will have to replace them. They're probably 8 volt lamps. I checked in the service manual. I did find this one. It's running off the negative 8.8 .8 volt rail from the power supply. So, uh, yeah, gonna have to look into that. JKL does have lamps for that, but I don't know where to buy them. Can't find them at Mauser. So, yeah, let me go off camera, play test this some more, and I'll get back to you if there's anything to get back to. All right, folks, there is still a problem with that control, so we're going to try to adjust it the way the Sony factory wants you to do it. I'm trying to set up my scope here so you can see. I've got the probe on the right pin for the uh, test point here, and I have cleaned that control, so should be no problems, but who knows. This thing, I'm about ready to 
be done with it, if you know what I mean. Okay, now, the adjustment procedure for this is here. They want you to go through the uh, gain and offset first. I'm not going to do that. I didn't touch those controls. Might have to do it anyway, but we'll see. I'm just going to try to get by with just doing the duty cycle adjustment because that's the only control I messed with. So let's power on and see what the scope does. Okay, that looks like a stable waveform, but it is not correct. It's supposed to be the difference between this and this is supposed to be 1 to 3 to 1 to 4 or something like that. So uh, let me see if I can bring it in. Oh, this control is so twitchy. You have no idea. So I'm kind of eyeballing it. Voltage peak to peak is 1.8 volts. And that's about right according to the uh, service data. But yeah, while I was trying to uh, play test this again, it was going all over the place with speed. It just wasn't holding stable speed. That could also be issues with the, uh, the uh, pinch rollers or oil getting onto the uh, tape or whatever, but uh, this looks like it's dialed in. It's hard for me to see. Can I get the uh, measurement here? I don't know if I can do it properly with this. What I need are uh, cursors. Do I have that with this scope? And I'm running this with a step-down transformer right now. I pulled the uh, four amp fuse out of my solder station to, to get it back up. Well, folks, if there's a cursor on here, I can't find it. We're just gonna have to eyeball this. So they want uh, the waveform to look just like this. And you tell me, does it look like that? It looks like that to me. It looks right about one to three, but that is where it's supposed to be. One to three to one to four. I could try fiddling with it some more, and I think I will. But this looks correct. It could be the speed has drifted back up to 3,008 hertz like, the, uh, like it showed when I first started working on this. I might do an off-camera wow and flutter check on this after this, but uh, right now I just want to see that this is working properly, and it looks like it is. So let me go play test it again and we'll find out. All right, folks, one more and one last update on this thing before I call it quits for now. As you can see, I've been playing the deck and watching it just to make sure that, that the uh, waveform stays proper. And I've been going back and forth between play and stop. And it's working, at least as far as the capstan duty cycle goes, but uh, we now have a, a problem with the other two direct drive take up reel, or reel tables. You know what I mean. And I've checked with the uh, with the uh, torque tape, and uh, we now have improper torque on the uh, supply side. So, um, yeah, it was basically causing this thing to shut down when I was trying to play a 45-minute tape earlier. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go in and do the full servo board calibration. That means doing all of this, take up and supply side, and I cannot do that without... Uh, a bench power supply because I need to find a way to apply 1.5 volts DC to it. Yeah, otherwise I can't align it. And I do not have a bench power supply. So uh, we're going to forego a record play test on this machine right now. And we're going to come back to it in the future. And we're going to do this once I've got a bench power supply. I don't know if I can afford it right now. We'll have to see. But uh, yeah, as of the end of the summer of Sony, we're getting there with this deck. It's not done yet. 
it will play now. It will do a record play test now, but it will not have the right, you know, well on flutter. It probably would work well enough with a 90 minute tape or 100 minute tape like I have with the uh, Sony Metal SRs, but uh, yeah, it's just going all over the place with the wow and flutter right now because the take up tension is uh, off the chart, as it were. So yeah, it was having trouble just fast forwarding and rewinding now. So that could be why the previous owner had the shutdown problems with this unit before. So uh, yeah, most likely what I'll do before I even go in there and try to do this calibration is I will replace every single capacitor on the board and just make sure everything's completely dialed in. So yeah, unfortunately no record play test with this thing. It sounds amazing, I'll tell you that right now, but I kind of want this deck to be fully sorted before you guys hear it for the first time. So yeah, that's going to be the end of this video. This won't be part of the summer of Sony when I get back to this unit, but we'll get back to it. It'll, it'll get fixed. It's well on the way to being fully fixed. So yeah, by the way, that popping noise is gone. So it was the capstan duty cycle switch, which has now been cleaned, by the way. But uh, yeah, when you make this adjustment on the capstan duty cycle, just watch the scope go into play and stop a few times. Watch the waveform, make sure it comes back to where it's supposed to be all the time and never loses sync. It's dialed in now, at least to my liking. And power it off and on a couple times. And make sure it settles in. And then, yeah, that, that setting is now sorted, but uh, just gotta get in there in the future and uh, deal with this other setup with the uh, servo motor adjustments on the, uh, you know what I mean. But yeah, like I said, I really think this design is too complicated for its own good, but uh, we're getting on top of it. So I'll see you in the next video. Take care.